Welcome, everyone, to our webinar today. Money doesn't grow on trees, but getting a business loan is easier than you think. We've got a great panel here today to bring you information that you need in order to apply for a loan and, most importantly, secure a loan successfully. Uh, today, you're going to be hearing from from Dawn Fotopoulos. She is the founder of HiddenProfit.com. And actually, that's HiddenProfitProfit.com. And she's Associate professor, professor of Business at the King's College of New York. Uh, you'll be hearing from myself. My name is Anita Campbell, and I'm the founder and CEO of Small Business Trends. And we'll also be hearing from Rohit Arora. He is the co-founder and CEO of Biz2Credit. And these are uh, your panelists. You see our smiling faces here. We'll be talking about a lot of things today, covering a lot of advice and information that you can take back and apply to your own business. And most importantly, you can take that information and uh, turn it into a successful loan application and a successful funding of your business. I'd like to first introduce Dawn Fotopoulos. She is the founder of Hidden Profit Profit. Uh, and of course, she is an associate professor at the King's College. Uh, she gives workshops for business owners on how to unlock the hidden profits in your business. She has written a fabulous book, just a wonderful book called Accounting for the Number Phobic, a survival guide for small business owners. And that book won the best business book of 2015 in economics in the Small Business Book Awards. And I understand it is a, a fabulous uh, book. and. Uh, funny, interesting, uh, and most informative. And she is a former vice president for Citigroup. Welcome, Dawn. Thank you, Anita. Good to be here. Great to have you here. And that is me, Anita Campbell. I'm the founder of Small Business Trends. Small Business Trends is uh, one of the largest independently owned uh, websites and media businesses for uh, the small business market. We do a lot of publishing on a regular basis of news for small businesses, uh, and we do that um, multiple times per day, and it's focused specifically for small businesses, as well as tips and advice. Uh, we also have a digital magazine. We also have uh, Kindle eBooks on various topics, and uh, we, we just love anything relating to business. and find it uh, just a, a fascinating area. We love to share this. That is my mission in life as the uh, founder and publisher. And I'd also like to introduce, of course, Rohit Arora. Now, Rohit is the co-founder of biz2credit.com. And Rohit is a real visionary because he foresaw many years ago what these online marketplaces could become that would bring together lenders, a uh, large number of lenders, and bring together people in businesses that are looking for credit. And today, the Biz2Credit network consists of over 1.6 million users and over 1,300 lenders. Now think of that. You can go to one place and you can get access to potentially 1,300 lenders. Where else can you do that? And how long would it take you to walk around or visit even a half dozen lenders and apply individually. Rohit is also one of the country's leading experts in small business finance and was 2011 Entrepreneur of the Year and 2014 Fast 50 by Crane's New York Business. Welcome, Rohit. Yeah, Anita, thanks for the introduction. Well, let's jump right in. What we're going to be talking about is what do lenders uh, look for, and besides banks, what lenders are out there. So banks are not the only game in town. There are a variety of different credit sources. Uh, and it's not just loans. There are many different kinds of loans, but there are other kinds of credit as well. 
uh, cash advances and certain other things. So Rohit's going to be walking us through that and giving us a picture of the landscape as it relates to financing. And then we're going to jump over to Don Fotopoulos, who is going to walk us through the mistakes to avoid when you're applying for a loan. So how do you increase your chances of getting funding? And then we'll be talking about some other topics related to entrepreneurship, including the steps that you need to go through to secure credit. We've got uh, 10 steps uh, that we'll close with that you can uh, take down and, and follow in order to increase your chances of getting financing. With that, I would like to turn over the microphone to Rohit Arora of Biz2Credit. Yeah, uh, so Anita, uh, thanks for the kind introduction and uh, I think uh, this is a very important uh, topic because, uh, you know, in the last six, seven years uh, it has been a very uh, tough market for small businesses to get access to credit uh, while the interest rates have been pretty low. And uh, uh, to, to today being called a visionary, uh, you know, myself is very flattering. You know, uh, but the key thing is that, you know, even I never foresee that this will get so tough for so many small business owners to get money from traditional lenders when we started the company prior to the recession. So I think uh, it's a very important topic because uh, as everybody know, cash is the lifeline and the bloodline of every single business. And how do you get access to credit and how do you get access to loans and uh, this is, uh, so that's an important thing. And the key thing also is that now, you know, unlike prior to the recession, there are a lot more options. So, the, so it's not only banks. So technology is changing a lot of that stuff. So just to, you know, walk you through, you know, this presentation, the key thing is that whether you're looking for a bank loan or you're looking for a non-bank loan, your credit history, both your business and personal, is extremely important. Uh, banks still look more at your personal credit scores, which are FICO scores, while non-banks can live with a lower FICO score, but they will still look at your payment behavior and your ability to pay your debts on time. So I think that's something very important uh, to look at it. As more and more lending moves online, your cash flow history of your business becomes the most important factor, even I would say equal or even a little bit more important than, than just the credit history. So if you have a great credit history, but you have a very poor cash flow in the business, it will become very difficult for you to get any kind of loans. So that's very important. And then how do you maintain your cash flow? Uh, you know, stuff is something that, you know, we'll talk later during the presentation, but it really means that, you know, you are collecting your bills on time, you, you are watching your expenses, you are, you know, managing your business in a way that every month you bring in sufficient cash to at least run your day-to-day -day operations. Uh, it's, it's perfectly fine if you are borrowing money to do and splurge it on marketing or you're buying a new piece of equipment or you're buying a new place to move your business in that most of the lenders will actually give you money for but nobody will give you money to cover your cash flow deficit month month after month if it is seasonal then still it will work uh, the other aspect is the business plan so that again is very important so you need to have some kind of a business plan it doesn't need to be a 20 page plan but at least even a one or a two pager where you can articulate your uh, vision of the business and what you need the money for and what you will do with that. So I think that's very important from that angle also that you know you need to have some kind of a plan for your business when you're borrowing money uh, because if you don't have a plan then you will more, more often than not uh, land into trouble while repaying your loans. Uh, then the third aspect is loan documentation. So prior to applying for a loan, you know, you, you need certain level of documentation. If you're applying to a bank, you need a lot more like your tax returns and your personal financial statements. If you're applying to an online lender, then you can, you know, live with less documentation, but you still need your last file tax return, your last six months of bank statements, your business licenses, uh, your personal driving license or any form of IDs and all that. So like have that handy uh, while you're starting to apply for a loan. Any kind of collateral you might have that will help you to get a secured loan that will also lower the cost, increase the term, or you're buying a piece of equipment or real estate. Uh, so don't put all of your own money into that. Always go and borrow some money because then you can use your own money for working capital, which is 
typically an unsecured loan and that is more expensive. Uh, again, you know, if, if, if profitable business model again goes back to your cash flow history. So if you can show a sustained profitability in your business, then you will get better terms, lower rate and more money. So that's important. Repayment of debt extremely important uh, because that helps you to build your business and personal credit history or it can destroy your credit history if you are uh, negligent in paying your debt on time and then you know you should be able to articulate and know the potential value of your customers that's important so know your customer is important because if you're borrowing money especially for marketing and for expanding your business the last thing you want to do is not to know that what level of business you will be able to generate uh, and what is the value of your customers. So I think that those are some very important aspects that uh, you need to have in mind, even if you're not borrowing money. Uh, so if you're borrowing money, then it becomes even more important. Uh, so as as we were saying, you know, when we started the business in 2007, you know, there were, there were only banks out there. There were banks, small banks, big banks, some credit unions, and that's it. But over the last five years, what the technology has done and what internet has done is that it's disrupting the whole financial services market and one of the ways it's not disrupting is by you know uh, letting a large number of family offices credit funds come in and say that you know they can actually now reach out to small businesses directly uh, because earlier you know you could only go and borrow money from a bank because that was the only shop in the town or only shop that you knew in the town but now you know you don't need to go to any bank branch. Even banks are starting to go online and digital. So you can go online, you can you know, search for loans, and there are a pretty decent number of family offices, credit funds, who are actually not only very keen, but they have been very you know, effective to start you know, lending you money. And we at Best to Credit actually work with a pretty fair number of uh, these kind of funds where you know we can uh, offer you money as a small business owner up to five years and rates starting as low as say nine to ten percent kind of stuff and uh, so so they're, they're still not as cheap as a bank loan but they're also not strong and uh, not as prohibitive as uh, uh, the normal cash advance where you know the terms are six to twelve months you're paying back money daily and the APRs could be very high starting at 30 to 40 percent and going up to 100 percent. So I think that's the at least one silver lining uh, in the dark clouds that has been there for small business lending is that there's a lot more lending options and a lot more loan options and as the economy improves, uh, the interest rates on these options are actually going down. So I think that's good. Uh, then as I said, you know, uh, there are so many different kind of loans, uh, especially in the small business space. So it can be very confusing. And that was one reason why we set up this credit to help business owners uh, not only get access to credit, but also get all the guidance free of cost. Uh, so you don't have to spend any money in trying to figure out what is the best loan for you or applying for it or getting the money. So here we list out, you know, some of the traditional uh, and non-traditional opportunities. So in traditional, you know, in, in US, the government has a big small business administration program, which actually guarantees small business loans and uh, one can apply uh, and get it uh, through banks or, or you can apply on this credit and we have a large number of lenders who will actually give you an SBA loan. Then there are traditional loans which are non-government guaranteed but still offered by banks and they are in a range of 4 to 7 percent while SBA loans are at around 6 percent a year. Uh, marketplace lending is all about your family offices, insurance companies, endowment funds. Uh, that the rates can be between 9 to 20 percent, so higher, but you can get money in 48 to 72 hours. Then working lines of credit are typically for companies which have account receivables, uh, business credit cards, you know, during the recession and after the recession, they just went out of uh, fashion or, or out of an option pool, but now, you know, they're starting to stage a comeback. But there, you know, business credit cards actually give you very little amount of money, and it's good if you're looking to you know, have uh, like an overdraft facility for 30 to 45 days. Real estate loans, again, if you're buying real estate or you're fixing up your property or you want to, you know, refinance it, your existing loan is the best time to do that because the interest rates are historical low and they won't remain at this level for very long. So I think it's a great time to do that. 
Factoring is for companies which have invoices, spending invoices where you get paid in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days and you need money uh, in your business to run your payroll, meet other expenses, so it's a good product. Uh, if you are in a high-tech business or a business that requires a lot of equity investment, then venture and angel investors are a very good source and you can look at sites like Angel List, which they go and, you know, uh, get some angel money, but that is really more catering towards high-tech companies, internet companies, uh, some bio, uh, bio sector and some of the other uh, more high-tech, so n not for the traditional mainstream businesses. Merchant cash advance, uh, you know, a product which can be used but should be used very carefully because it, it's pretty high cost and this really against, is against your uh, uh, credit card receivable. So if you are as a business owner accept credit cards, so you can borrow some more advance against your credit card receivable. Then there are, uh, you know, uh, now because of, uh, as I said, internet is changing the game. So there are peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sites where you can get peer to peer like either loans or, or what we call still today's equity, you know, from Kickstarter, Indiegogo. But there, you know, that is again for those companies or businesses which are developing an interesting product and not for day-to-day uh, -day or a business. So I think those are the loans and and what we have been doing over last, uh, you know, six or five years now, you know, as Anita said, you know, we are trying to solve this or, or demystify small business loan market. And one of the things that, you know, we're very proud and very um, effective, have been very effective, is that we launch a small business lending index. And that gives you an idea of uh, approval rates by big banks, small banks, alternative lenders, uh, your credit unions, uh, and uh, what we call the institu institutional lenders. So that's a good way for you to go and see that, you know, who is giving loans, what is the approval rates, what are the, what are the, what is the pricing on those loans, you know, where you can get better loans or, you know, where there's a less chance of you're getting a loan. So this, uh, you know, we're trying to demystify, trying to make it easy for people because one big issue and challenge still is that small business owners are very busy people and they're very little time. And for them to go and apply for loans uh, in traditional banks is still very paper intensive and takes forever. So I think that's a very, very important uh, aspect uh, that we are educating uh, uh, the people as well as the lenders also, that how they can improve their uh, approval rates also at any given point of time. We can go on to the next slide. Uh, then. So, you know, uh, so this slide really talks about, you know, loan approval that small banks so traditionally during the recession, the good news was that small banks were still approving almost 50% of those loans. But now, you know, over the last few uh, months, you know, we're starting to see, uh, so there, there's some good news that big banks are coming back, but they're still, you know, uh, at least 50% lower in their approval rates compared to the recession. And small banks are starting to become a little bit of a laggard in this industry. So this is very interesting, you know, and that is because of increasing competition and also, you know, small banks are not putting a lot of money in technology and a lot of business owners are looking for an online experience which they are not able to provide today. So I think that's a message for small banks that they should not lose out their market share the way they lost it in the consumer loans in 1990s. Uh, and it's a message for them also to improve their game out there in the market. Next slide, you can go next slide. So this way it talks about alternative lenders and alternative lenders and institutional lenders is really just happened in the last three, four years. And one big reason is because of let's say technology. Now you don't need a big branch network. You don't need money to build a brand. And as a lender, you can go and reach out uh, to a very large number of businesses out there. So I think as a business owner, you can start taking advantage of that uh, now and you should be able to get more uh, access to credit. And the good news there is that, you know, more are coming back and start buying loans from institutional lenders down the line. So like if you if you build a track record with institutional lenders, are, in our experience, over the next one and a half to two years, you will actually have a better shot at getting a bank loan also. So I think that is something very interesting happening, uh, which uh, business owners should take advantage of, uh, which they are, if they are, thinking about, you know, expanding their business because from a economic cycle, this is the best time to borrow money. Interest rates are still historically low 
uh, economy has improved quite a bit over the last 18 months. Housing prices have actually stabilized or, or are going up. And the and I think the best thing which is happening is gas prices are, are at historical low. Uh, so I think this is the best time for you to borrow money and expand business because we foresee that next two to three years where it will be pretty good for small businesses. So if you borrow today and invest money, it gives you enough time to expand your business and pay down your debt. Uh, so that when the next, whenever the next recession comes, you are stronger. Uh, so then, uh, uh, then if you borrow money later during the economic cycle, actually. So uh, I think those are the things that we are looking at it. And then you know, credit unions have been very interesting. So credit unions was one of the big hopes during the recession, but you know they haven't really uh, met those expectations. So they were good during the recession because there was nobody else. But but now as more money comes back in, their approval rates haven't gone up. And again, the reason is they're very small. They haven't invested money in technology. They don't have a good uh, footprint. They don't have uh, smart ways of underwriting businesses ready for businesses who are searching for credit more and more online. So I think that's where it gets it's getting very interesting. So I think earlier the divide was you know as a lender you needed all the licenses and you need to have capital and only then you will grow. Now the divide is going to become a, even among the lenders if you are digital or non-digital. So if you're a non-digital lender, you know, the chances of you being able to attract good customers and offer them good pricing will start going um, away. And that will not be a good thing for a lot of these offline lenders. So I think those are important things uh, uh, out there uh, for people to consider. And they can follow our index every month. We release it on second Tuesday after the job reports. And uh, they can get free subscription to it. They can, you know, talk to our loan specialist. So so this, this is very important because this gives a pulse of the market on an ongoing basis. And then you can see you know, if you're if you're gonna apply for a loan or want a loan, what's your best chance of getting a loan uh, during a certain time period. Okay. Thank you, Rohit. Um, that was uh, very helpful and I do want to say before we bring on uh, Don Fotopoulos that if you have a question uh, please type it into the little chat box window that appears on your screen and we'll try to get to all the questions. Uh, we've had some questions come in already on social media and elsewhere before the event, uh, so we will allow time at the end to ask questions. Uh, but um, please feel free to type in your questions into the box. Um, with that, I would like to turn over the microphone at this point to Don Fotopoulos to walk us through the mistakes to avoid when applying for a loan. Don, take it away. Thanks, Anita. Ruit, you gave us a really great broad brush understanding of what the acceptance rates are for business loans by lender. Thank you very much. I thought that was enormously helpful. And I think the one big takeaway we all need to have is that there is no one lender that gives 100% loans to everybody that puts a loan application out there. And anywhere from 20% 20, 20 or one out of five loan applications to the large banks, or perhaps four or five out of 10 with some of these specialty lenders, uh, is pretty much what we've seen. So what, what I want to do is go through the five kind of mistakes or five tips really to help you be that one out of five or that four out of ten where your loan application is received and you get funded. So uh, don't wing it. <laughs> it's about being prepared and Rohit talked a little bit about that documentation and so on. I want to talk a little bit about how to think like a banker and not a business owner because in this situation when you're applying for a loan it is the lender who is your target audience and there is a way that they think and there are priorities that they set when they're reviewing all their loan applications and as a former banker I feel like I have an inside view of that and I think that will really help put your best foot forward when applying for a loan. The next thing is to be clear on how you plan on using the money, and I know Rohit also talked a little bit about that, but I want to do a deeper, a little bit of a deeper dive on how to connect the dots between the allocation of resources once you do get the funding and how that lowers the risk factor for the lender. Uh, the all, also, it's important to know how you'll repay the loan 
and um, and that's where the business planning and the and the forecasting and all of that becomes very important. And then of course matching the life of the loan to the life of the asset, which is more a tip than anything. But at any rate, let's let's go through it. Slide one, don't wing it. <laughs> Your numbers need to be strong and they need to stand on their own. The loan application, whether it's online or offline, it needs to stand by itself because you are not going to be there to answer their questions and uh, to clarify anything. So I want you to always remember that a confused banker or a confused lender will always say no. So it's super, super important that your financials are current that they are accurate and that they are complete. And it sounds so basic, but I took a survey among 5,000 small business owners over the years that I panel moderated for the New York Times Small Business Summit Conference, and Anita, I know you know those guys super well. And I can tell you that in seven out of 10 cases, these, these business owners uh, cannot access their financials, that is their income statement, cash flow statement, and balance sheet easily, and they don't update them until they have to do their taxes. So this is a very, very important basic business discipline that you need to do. And accurate bookkeeping is critical, but it will also help you with that statement mandate. In other words, make sure that your reconciliations are done on time, make sure you as the business owner have access to this information. And uh, the Pro Advisor Network, which is put together by the QuickBooks Intuit people, is a great place. It's sort of an Angie's list for bookkeepers and, and CPAs, but I find it super helpful. So, but the bottom line is uh, your lender is going to scrutinize those statements and it's very, very important that they are crisp and super clean. So don't wing it. Uh, in slide two, I want to talk about thinking like a banker. And here's something no one's ever going to tell you, that banks or lenders are not in the business of taking on risk. They are in the business of making money. They take on risk simply because it is the necessary evil in order for them to make money on the interest rates that they charge for their loans. So the way that they win is they want to reduce risk as much as possible and they want to lend to those businesses that represent the least risk and have the highest probability of payback. Now we sort of know that intuitively, but uh, the way that plays out practically is the following. And uh, Rohit talked a little bit about this. You don't apply for a loan when you need the money. Now that sounds a little counterintuitive. <laughs> uh, but if you do apply for a loan when you need the money and you're cash strapped, it looks like your business is on life support. It doesn't look like you have a going concern, which in the lender's eyes looks as though you're far higher risk. Now, most of us have businesses that have a seasonality to revenues and to cash flow. So if you're a photographer, for example, or a retailer, even better example, in the fourth quarter, most of your re revenues are backloaded. Uh, but you know that in advance. So the best time to apply for a loan is when? When your bank account looks nice and fat and you look like you're a low risk. Uh, you have a pretty good idea what your expenses are going to be, so apply for the loan Frankly, when you don't need it, it's going to be a lot easier for you to close that loan. Uh, the other thing that's really important is, and, and Rohit, again, he mentioned this, your personal life and your business life are part of the same ecosystem when you're being evaluated for a loan for the business. If you are running a privately held business, and most of us on this call are, then the bank is going to look at your entire net worth as if it is coming from the same place. So please don't go out and buy the big house and buy the expensive car at the same time you're applying for a business loan because the obvious response from the lender is, well, why are you expanding on the personal side and the business side at the same time you look like you're much higher risk? And in fact, you are. So the business is the engine that drives your personal life. Take care of the engine and the engine will take care of of your of your life and your lifestyle. So that actually came from a senior vice president from HSBC. I sat down with her and uh, chapter eight of the book that Anita mentioned to you earlier, Accounting for the Number Phobic, is called How to Win Friends and Influence Bankers. And what she basically did is she went through these five mistakes that a lot of uh, loan seekers make and she said you'd be amazed at how many people who are running businesses 
uh, are taking on all kinds of debt in their personal lives at the same time they're applying for a loan. And what happens behind the scenes at the lender is all of these uh, lending, uh, whether they're bankers or lending institutions, they look at every single one of these loan applications as part of their portfolio. And the way they make money and they get to keep their jobs is they need to lend to where they want to lend to, as I said earlier, the lowest risk, highest return um, uh, loans. They want to make the highest return loans. So they're looking at all these loans from a high earth orbit view and they're looking to cherry pick those companies, those businesses that, that have the highest payback rate and the lowest risk for them. So at any rate, apply for a loan when you have strong cash flow. And the lending committees will look at you far more favorably if you do that. So the third tip, if you will, is you've got to be really clear on how you will use the money. And I know that sounds pretty basic, you'd, but you'd be shocked when you look at some of these loan applications how poorly the, the business seeking the loan actually describes how they're going to use the money. And Rohit mentioned earlier, whatever loan money, um, whatever money that you're applying for rather in a loan, has to drive one or more of the following three things. It has to help you drive profitability, it has to help you drive, or it has to help you build your asset base faster than your liability base. Because what happens is if you play it out in your head and you get a loan, on the balance sheet, what effectively happens is your cash goes up, so your assets go up, but your liabilities go up exactly the same amount. Now the question becomes, what do you do with that cash that just came in or the access to cash in a credit line? Are you going to improve your system's backbone so that your cycle time goes down, so your productivity goes up? Are you going to invest in... Uh, are you going to scale a marketing campaign that was very effective, but now you want to reach broader audiences and that's going to drive your revenues? Are you going to find a way to, uh, to spend money in or invest money in property, plant, and equipment so you can drive down cost of goods you know, and improve your gross margins? So what you need to do is not only say how you're going to use the money, but how you connect the dots between how this loan is going to help you drive, again, profits, cash flow, and essentially net worth on your balance sheet. So um, that's what this whole expanding operations to meet demand or effective marketing or systems in IT to improve productivity is all about. The other thing is um, you want to build your asset base. You know, at the end of the day, we're all in business so, and the business itself becomes an asset. At some point in the future, if we all play our cards right, most of us don't, We'd like to have this asset that has some terminal value. You know, we want to not just be able to pay the bills and a little bit left over for our personal lives, but we want to be able to sell these businesses at, you know, multiples of cash flow. And the only way that's going to happen is, is, is if we build our asset base faster than our liabilities. And assets, of course, are the current and the fixed assets. But one of the things that a lender is going to look at is they're going to look at how well you manage your accounts receivables. Because in 8 out of 10 cases, and I've spoken to thousands and thousands of business owners, in 8 out of 10 cases, they do a really terrible job of managing their outstanding invoices to clients that owe them money. So they're applying for a loan because they're in a cash crunch because they're not managing their AR very well. So if your accounts receivables are older than 30 days, don't apply for a loan. Get on the stick with your accounts receivables first. Prove to the lender that you know how to collect on outstanding invoices. Your business is going to be a lot more stable, and frankly, that's free money to you. Um, work on your accounts receivables first and then apply for a loan. And I have to tell you a very funny story. One of the, the greatest episodes on Shark Tank was um, there were three founders up there and they were pitching their business to the, the investors and, you know, obviously very savvy people. And, uh, and Lori uh, Grenier asks a very simple question. She said, well, what are you going to do with the money? And one of the founders says, I'm going to pay myself more in salary. And everybody started groaning and rolling, rolling their eyes in the back of their head. That's a bad answer because if the business 
is not generating enough cash flow to pay you what you think you're worth, and you've got to fix the business. You can't expect an investor or a lender to line your pocket. So Mr. Wonderful turned around and said, you're dead to me, <laughs> which is essentially the same thing as saying, that's a bad answer, my friend. Okay, so you're not going to make the same mistake. Slide four is going to explain how you intend to repay the loan. And one of the things I always say is, you know, getting the loan is the easy part, and it's not easy if you can remember what those closure rates were that Rohit talked about. But paying it back is the hard part, and your cash flow projections are absolutely essential. And those cash flow projections have to be grounded in assumptions that are supportable and where you have adequate evidence. So um, your cash flow projections, you really need to think that through. And everything from what's in your sales pipeline, uh, what kind of orders you already have in your hands, repeat purchases with existing customers, all of those things are going to be very important. Lifetime value of a customer is important because they help the lender look forward. What your financial statements do is your financial statements basically are evidence that your business is a going concern and you're the right one to run it, but your financial statements in effect are forensic. It captures everything that already happened. What we're trying to do is give the lender a level of confidence about where we think the business is going and why, which is why your roadmap, your business plan is so important because that's how you're going to navigate the near future and why the documentation is so important is because that's the evidence that you know what you're talking about. So uh, we talked a little bit about how lenders are in the business of making money. They are not in the business of taking on risk, although they do it because they have to. But one of the most profound things anybody ever told me in business came from Norm Brodsky. And in accounting for the number phobic, he is, it's basically a transcription of a two-hour conversation that I had with him, and that's chapter 10. And he said something that just blew my mind. He said, if your working capital is negative, in other words, if your current assets minus your current liability is negative, you will go bankrupt. It's just a matter of time. And I said, holy cow, you know, I've never heard anybody say that. Why do you say that? And he said, because your, your current liabilities, namely things like credit lines and, and short-term notes and things like that, can be called at any time. So if you don't have enough cash or enough liquidity on the current asset side, your business is at risk is essentially what he's saying. So what you always need to keep an eye on is this working capital at least positive so that you don't frankly have to worry if a credit line is called and so you should play offense is the point and this is really about loan management strategy so last but not least you should really um, next slide please okay Match the life of the loan to the life of the asset you're financing. Now, we sort of know this intuitively, but it's really useful to keep in mind. Uh, make sure your business has that viable long-term plan that Rohit was talking about. And you should have probably a 12-month, 18-month plan, and then you should have a three- to five-year plan. Uh, you got to look at your inventory levels and other credit lines. So, for example, uh, when I had my t-shirt business a thousand years ago and we were selling to Lands End Yacht stores and to some of the big retailers in Chicago, the faster we were able to turn our inventory, the less cash we needed to run the business because every time we sold a t-shirt, we actually made money on it because we made gross margin and we were, we were expanding our cash position by doing that. So it's not just your inventory levels, but it's also your inventory turn that will help you uh, manage cash more effectively and other credit lines. A lot, of credit, a lot of suppliers, by the way, will extend credit, especially if you're buying things like property, plant, and equipment, that they will, especially equipment, they will, you know, provide financing opportunities, which actually helps your cash flow, at least while you're, you're getting that up and running. The other thing I just want to say is ask for more than you think you'll need, because the absolute worst thing you can do is you can uh, apply for a loan, get the loan, end up in a cash crunch three or six months later, and then feel the need to go back out to the capital markets and apply for another loan. That's really a big no-no, and it's not well received. So ask for more than you'll need. You can all, most of the time, you can prepay it without penalty. Uh, the other thing, too, is evaluate the benefits of short versus long-term. Roe was talking about the cost of capital 
with all these various permutations and opportunities uh, from lenders. And it really makes a very, very big difference. You might even want to pull in your chief financial officer, certainly, and possibly your accountant to, uh, to have those kind of conversations. And of course, if you have machinery or other equipment, you're going to match the life of the loan to the life of the asset. And what I'm finding is as technology keeps changing and, and it's such a dynamic environment, it's changing so quickly that the life of a technology asset, to me anyway, and Rohit, you may, you may have a different point of view, but it's getting shorter and shorter. So uh, what you're buying today and installing today, you know, two years or three years from now could be a dinosaur. So just, just keep in mind, you don't want to be, you don't want to take out a loan on an asset and continue to pay on that asset if that asset's not working hard for the business. So at any rate, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. There are five simple steps that you can follow to unlock hidden profit in your business, and you can feel free to visit the hiddenprofitprofit.com and pick up a, a free report that'll kind of take you through those five simple steps. But I hope this was helpful, and feel free to ask any questions that you want as a result. Well, thank you very much, uh, Don. That was fabulous, really great points. And I know we have a number of questions. We'll be getting to those in uh, just a moment. Uh, but I would like to take an opportunity to go through quickly 10 steps to securing credit. Now, I'm going to emphasize points that have already been made in some uh, respects by Rohit and also by Don. But I think it's a good recap. So the first thing to do is build a business credit history. Even though you are uh, applying for a loan and, and your personal credit will be taken into account if you're a small business owner, you also want a separate credit history for your business. And that doesn't necessarily happen automatically. Uh, I've heard Rohit uh, advise before that the first step is try to get a business credit card because it's easier to get a business credit card first than to apply for a big loan and make sure you're paying it make you know your payment history is going to be really important create a consistent payment history uh, that's going to be very good uh, and uh, also you know, make sure your business itself is just uh, established as a separate entity separate and apart from you as the business owner Step two, gather your documentation. You know, Don emphasized uh, the importance of having good financials, the importance of uh, getting your ducks in a row and making sure that the package you present to the lender is a complete package because that's all they're going to have in front of them. So be sure that you have all of that information, that you've taken the time to go through it, that you have it collected, that everything is in order and that your books are up to date. Number three, the next step is to line up references. Make sure you've got references in case they are needed by the lender. And you know, very often that's going to be customers and importantly suppliers and vendors, uh, any business partners you might have, uh, even colleagues that you work with. These are going to be very important because lenders will ask for some references, at least careful lenders do ask for this, uh, and you're going to want to have them and line them up in advance. You know, um, Make sure that if you give the name of a reference, you're confident that they're going to uh, say positive things about their experience with you as it relates to financial matters. Step four is improve your personal credit score. And of course, you know, as that was mentioned earlier, that's really, really important to have a good personal credit score because for most small businesses, especially those with 20 or fewer employees, the business owner's uh, personal credit is uh, integrally tied in the lender's mind with the repayment ability as well as the, the overall credit picture. So it's important to have a really good personal credit score. And there are a lot of monitoring tools out there today that will help you monitor what your score looks like. And they give you educational information that tells you how to improve your personal score, such as not maxing out your credit cards and you know, just making sure that you have information that, that is uh, uh, correct and accurate and fixing any errors that you see. Step five in getting 
credit is to make sure you do have that separate entity. It really does help because while it's not a direct lending uh, factor, it what it says is this is a legitimate business. You're serious about your business. Uh, the business is a separate entity from you. Uh, you're paying all your payments. You're keeping that up to date in states where you have to pay those kinds of things. Step six, pay down your debts. You don't want to be maxed out. You don't want to be uh, hurting for money. As Dawn mentioned earlier, that's going to be a red flag that lenders are going to look at because it suggests too much risk. And as she pointed out, they're not in the business of taking risks. They're in the business of making money on their loans. Step seven, you want to stand out from the crowd and build credibility with your online presence. You know, one of the things that was interesting to me whenever I have uh, applied for business credit is how much the lender or the um, financing uh, entity really took the time to understand the business. I mean, even in this day and age, if you look for a business checking account, uh, any responsible bank, is it really going to take the time to talk with you and understand the kind of business that you're in? They, you know, they're assessing you. They want to make sure you're a legitimate business. Um, they, they want to, you know, know that, um, you know, they're, who they're dealing with. And so they're going to want to know about you. And of course, today they're going to look you up online. So all those things that we have out there about our businesses, uh, any negative customer reviews on, on Yelp and, and um, Facebook profiles and Twitter profiles and so on, these are all going to factor in in the impression that you make with a lender or a bank. Step eight, you want to improve your cash flow and your accounts receivable. Dawn talked about that. I think enough said. Step nine, lower those operating costs. Make sure that your financials are really looking good. And step 10, uh, apply to multiple lenders. Uh, and as Rohit talked about this earlier, and this I think is one of the tremendous advantages of something like biz2credit.com is the ability for you to reach out and touch multiple lenders um, uh, or at least explore multiple lenders because every lender is not the same. Every loan, every type of financing, it's not the same. They're all very different. And part of the secret to success is finding a good match between your current situation and your needs and what a lender has to offer currently and those terms and whether those two things match up. And that's where a technology platform like biz to credit and the kind of advisors at Biz2Credit can really help you because they can connect you with multiple lenders without you having to run around and do a lot of labor-intensive time work, uh, time-consuming legwork, uh, or you know potentially have to put your business on hold while you're going out and looking for a loan. So, 10 steps to securing credit, and at this point, we have a few minutes, and I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, we do have some questions here, and so I have a question, actually several questions for Rohit. Uh, the first question uh, concerns SBA loans, Rohit. You mentioned uh, a little bit about what SBA loans are, but the question is, who do you apply to for an SBA loan, and how do they work? Yeah, so I think that's a very good question. And SBA loans are actually not given out by Small Business Administration. They are guaranteed by Small Business Administration. And there are almost 2,500 banks in the country, including some of the larger or most of the larger banks. Uh, the process is a little tedious. So what we have done at Best of Credit is that you can come uh, apply. And we have a whole digital platform now where you can get your SBA loans also from some of these large as well as small SBA lenders. And uh, so either you can do that or you can go to your neighborhood bank and can ask them for more information on SBA loans uh, uh, and they will give you a uh, ream of forms to go and fill. Uh, so it's, a, it's one of the most, uh, or I would say one of the oldest uh, government guarantee program uh, in the world and also the most established program. Uh, and, uh, and the good news is you can get money at 
at pretty low cost. But the bad news there is there's a lot, there's a lot of paperwork involved, and it's a slow process. So that can take anywhere between 60 to 90 days to get an SBA loan. So one need to one needs to plan well mm -hmm. ahead of time, you know, for that. So not not necessarily the fastest type of financing to get. No. <laughs> All right. Good. All right, here's a question for Dawn. Dawn, you mentioned something was rather startling. Uh, maybe not to you because you've heard it before, but to uh, some of us it was rather startling. And you mentioned that many small business owners do not update their financials until tax time. Did I hear that correct? Yes, you did. <laughs> and yep. it's, so that sounds amazing. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's sort of interesting. You know, we're all so busy, Anita, working in our businesses, servicing customers, putting out fires, that we ignore the financials. And the financials are sort of like your spouse. They're always talking to you, but you've got to pay attention and listen. Because at some point, you know, you, if the business gets, you want to know what's happening in the business before you end up in crisis. And you certainly don't want your lender to tell you, oh, by the way, do you know that you're bankrupt? <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a problem. So what a lot of business owners really need to do is, um, first of all, I think, was it Intuit? I think Intuit just came out with a uh, research study that said 85% of business owners do their own books and 40% of them admit to financial illiteracy. Now, if 40% admit to financial illiteracy and they use those words exactly, then you have to know the real number is probably closer to twice that. So imagine, right, you're doing your own books and you have absolutely no idea what you're doing. So put those two data points together and you have a disaster. So the first thing that needs to happen is you need to make sure you have the right people supporting you on the day-to-day -day and monthly basis capturing all the transactions and all the cash flows that are going in and out of the business. And that's why I mentioned something about a bookkeeper. Because almost everybody has an accountant because it's so it's so complex to put our taxes together. But a bookkeeper will help you with the day-to-day -day stuff. And then what I do, because I have both a bookkeeper and an accountant, that bookkeeper reduced my accounting fees to half because she basically does all the reconciliations and we hand it all you know, in a nice clean package to the accountant and he can get the job done for the IRS in half the time. But what's even more beautiful about that particular process is that I, you know, she sends me my reports. I don't even have to pull them. She sends them to me and I look at them, my cash flow statement, my income statement, and my balance sheet on a regular basis. I know exactly what's going on in my business. And then periodically, I bring in a forensic accountant to just do a surprise audit to keep everybody honest and make sure that, you know, everything's copacetic. And, um, and it works out very nicely. So the point is, is a business owner should not be doing their own books. They really should not. They should have a professional doing their books because their time is better spent managing their staff, developing their staff, developing new markets, developing new products and services because that's what's going to drive the business forward. If they have the right people on the control side, then they should be spending their time on the revenue producing side. Thank you. That was uh, great advice. And uh, one follow-up question. Uh, is it expensive to get somebody to uh, keep, you know, to enter your accounting information and make sure your your books are kept up to date each month? Is there any kind of a range that you can look at? I mean, are we talking thousands of dollars per month? Or oh no, no, it doesn't have to be anywhere near that. Um, you know, Bench.co is an organization that is specifically structured for small businesses, solopreneurs. I would budget probably a few hundred dollars a month, maybe two or three hundred dollars a month. It depends on how complex your business is, how many transactions you do. But if you have a banking relationship where everything is online and they can just download your bank statements and do the reconciliation for you, I mean, that's a huge time saver. And bookkeepers, depending on where you are in the country, range anywhere from let's say 30 bucks an hour to 60 bucks an hour, which is a heck of a lot less expensive than the 250 that most accountants, anywhere from 150 to 250 an hour that accountants charge. So it costs me, right now I have a consulting business, it costs me about $150 a month 
to do the bookkeeping and uh, my accounting fees are about $1,500 a year, which I think is a cheap date. Oh, thank you for that insight. That's uh, very good. I agree. That is uh, uh, very little money in the overall scheme of things. And just think how, how well that could serve you if that could help you get better financing and better terms. That's right. Good. A uh, question for Rohit. And Rohit, this concerns PayPal, it concerns Square, and other services like that. That today, um, you can go on their websites and you can quickly apply for what they call um, cash advances. Uh, and you can do that in literally like a matter of minutes. Uh, are those good deals? I mean, what are the advantages and disadvantages of getting money like that from something like PayPal and Square? And can you get enough money to make a difference? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. So there are a few advantages that if you are you know, with PayPal or with Square and you want to get money, so you can get money pretty quickly without having to provide a lot of documentation uh, that a traditional bank uh, will look for. Uh, so I think that's a good news. Uh, the bad news there is, uh, you know, then you are, uh, so you will get money only on uh, the uh, number of or the volume of your transactions on PayPal or on uh, Square. Uh, the other downside of that is that, you know, if you're looking money to buy a piece of equipment or some more long-term, you know, stuff like anything uh, which is more than 12 months, then it's not the best place to borrow money. If you're looking to borrow money to, you know, because you, you're a seasonal business and you want to, you know, uh, run the next few payrolls or you have some immediate need for cash, then I think that's one of the best places to go and, you know, borrow money. Uh, again, the other downside is there's a lot of hidden costs there. So, like, one has to be careful. So, the sticker rate will look low, but, you know, if you're with PayPal, you know, they're already charging you, uh, you know, much higher amount than anybody else in transaction fees. Uh, so, I think you have to also factor that into account. You know, with Square, you know, again, the issue becomes is that in case of, you know, any payment frauds or anything, then you are liable for that. So I think you, as a business owner, you have to, you know, uh, look into that. You can look towards these options as, you know, uh, short-term uh, cash. And also the other thing is that, you know, something like PayPal will not, or Square will not lend more than 10 to $15,000 on an average. So I think you need to plan and be aware about that. So it's relatively small amounts of money. I mean, in you know, in some senses, it's it's less than you can get on a, a credit card balance. Absolutely. So I think that's what you have to then plan very clearly whether you know if 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 it is worth it. You know, in some cases it is worth it, and in some cases you know it's not uh, because uh, you know the amount of uh, you know money that you have to pay back and uh, the way that you have to do it. So obviously, if you're looking for it's like quick money to solve a quick problem go for it but if you're looking to borrow that money to build your business or to do some marketing and all that then I don't think so that's the best place to get your money from. Mm, thank you well we are just about out of time so at this point I'd like to wrap up I'd like to ask each of our panelists to give us one final bit of advice and also tell us again remind us where uh, people can find out more so I'll start with uh, Don Fotopoulos. Don, any parting um, quick thoughts, and where can people find out more? Well, the, the last thing I want to leave everybody with, I mentioned it in the presentation, is look at your accounts receivables before you start reaching out for loan money. And make sure that you have consistent discipline. And don't take, especially for service providers, don't take long-term clients for granted because sometimes those long-term clients can stop paying you as well. So keep a consistent business practice about making sure you get paid on time. And if anybody wants to reach me, they can reach me at my personal email, which is dphotopolis at gmail.com, or please find me at thehiddenprofitprofit.com, or they can follow me on Twitter, at dphotopolis. Thank you very much, Don, for that. And uh, Rohit Arora, um, would you give us, please, uh, any final thoughts? And where can people find out more about Biz2 Credit? Yeah, so I think as Don rightly said, you know, you could be a very profitable business and still you can go bankrupt. Uh, because if you don't uh, collect your bills on time, you know, uh, and we have seen it in a lot of businesses, you know, they don't have any idea of how to structure contracts and even follow up 
to actually get their account disabled. So I think that's very important. You you can run a profitable business and can still go bankrupt. So like keep that in mind. Uh, because you know whether you borrow money or you don't borrow money, if you don't collect your money, you will be in trouble. So I think that that's very important. And also, you know, just keep a tab on your uh, on your credit uh, profile, both personal and business. And you can do it on Visto Credit free of cost uh, through a phone app, uh, Android, i iPhone, or uh, on your dashboard, what we call Biz Analyzer. So so that's totally free. You can get your access update of your personal credit, so it's all soft pool, your business credit, your business cash flow, because you have to have an idea and, and maintain a very tight grip on that. And you can find me anytime at say info at bistocred.com, so if you email it, it comes directly to me, or you can you know dial our toll free number at 800-200-5678, and we have uh, loan specialists available seven days a week. Uh, that's true. seven days a week to help you, you know, guide you through any process or even just chat about, you know, what your needs are. Very good. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Rohit Aurora. And my name again is Anita Campbell of Small Business Trends. And if you're looking for uh, news that affects small businesses, looking for tips and advice, uh, we have over 500 contributors as well as a paid staff of uh, writers who stay on top of the news. So come and visit us at smallbiztrends.com or you can get to us at smallbusinesstrends.com and we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, Don Fotopoulos, hiddenprofitprofit.com and Rohit Aurora of biz2credit.com and this concludes today's webinar. Thanks.